in a shadowed town where ancient woods whisper secrets. A young real estate agent dreams of a fortune, unaware he's about to step into a nightmare. <laughs> where greed meets the supernatural. Under the full moon, the hunter becomes the hunted. Welcome to the chilling tale of the werewolf's woods. In the opulent heart of London, the towering office of Hargrave Real Estate buzzed with the vibrant energy of success and ambition. The glass and steel structure, a testament to modern architectural prowess, stood like a titan among the city's historic landscape, its reflective surfaces catching the golden hues of the late afternoon sun. Inside on the 15th floor, the atmosphere was electric with the buzz of a new project. In a spacious, well-lit office adorned with sleek furniture and framed accolades, Daniel Harrison, a young and confident real estate agent, lounged in his leather chair, a self-assured smile playing on his lips. With his sharp suit and meticulously styled hair, Daniel exuded the kind of charm and poise that was all too rare in the cutthroat world of real estate. I'll have this deal in the bag before the month is out, Daniel boasted, his voice carrying a mix of arrogance and naivete. He was speaking to a group of colleagues who gathered around his desk, hanging on his every word. Despite his limited experience in land acquisitions, Daniel had landed this high-profile position thanks to his connection with Gregory Atkins, a member of the governing board and an old family friend. The Hargrave housing project is going to be the crown jewel of our portfolio, he continued, his eyes gleaming with the reflection of the computer screen that displayed the project's details. 1.5 billion pounds, gentlemen. Just imagine the commissions on that. His colleagues murmured their agreement some with genuine admiration, others with thinly veiled envy. They knew the project's success rested on acquiring a crucial piece of land, a vast tract of ancient woodland in a small mist-shrouded town miles away from the bustling city. The owner, some hermit named Elijah, won't know what hit him, Daniel said with a dismissive wave of his hand, a bit of charm, a dash of persuasion, and he'll be signing the land over. How can anyone say no to this much money? Little did Daniel know, the land in question was steeped in a history far more complex and ancient than any file on his desk revealed. The owner, Elijah, was a character shrouded in mystery, known in the town for his eccentricity and a peculiar disinterest in the material world. As the conversation in the office turned to plans for the evening, Daniel leaned back in his chair, his thoughts already drifting to the misty town and the easy victory he anticipated. In his mind, the deal was as good as done. The contract signed, the land his for the taking. But far away, in the heart of the ancient woodland, under the looming shadow of centuries-old trees, a different story was waiting to unfold. A story of primal forces, ancient curses, and a lineage as old as the land itself. A story where the hunter could very quickly become the hunted under the light of the full moon. Unaware of the impending storm he was about to step into, Daniel Harrison smiled, basking in the glow of his anticipated success. The sleek, black car rolled to a stop at the edge of a vast expanse of ancient woodland, where a large, weathered wooden gate stood as a silent guardian. Daniel Harrison, still exuding the confidence of a city shark in his designer suit, checked his watch with a frown. It was 12.35 p.m., 35 minutes past the agreed meeting time. These backward people can't even tell the time, he muttered under his breath, his gaze fixed on the dense trees that seemed to watch him with a thousand unseen eyes. Suddenly, the rustling of leaves and the crunch of footsteps broke the eerie silence. Daniel straightened up as a figure emerged from the woods. The man, Elijah, looked every bit the recluse he was rumoured to be. Dressed in simple handmade clothes, 
his eyes sharp and untrusting. Daniel, ever the polished professional, opened his mouth to speak, armed with charm and rehearsed lines, but Elijah cut him off abruptly. Let me stop you right there. I don't like you. I don't like that you made me walk through the woods from my house to meet you here. I don't like your face. Now, get on with it. I'll give you five minutes, he said, his voice gruff and unwelcoming. Swallowing his irritation, Daniel quickly launched into his pitch, explaining the generous government-backed offer for Elijah's land. He spoke of the housing project, the benefits to the community, and the substantial sum of money involved. Elijah listened impassively, then replied, What need have I for money? Money is just a tool for exchange, to buy an item from someone else. I don't need anything from anyone. I grow my own vegetables, hunt in my woods for meat, and drink from my well. What need have I for money? Undeterred, Daniel suggested that Elijah could buy nice clothes, a bigger home, or a new car. But Elijah dismissed each suggestion with a wave of his hand. I have a house, I make my clothes, and my legs are good. But you offer me money that's not yours. Government money is money taken from hard-working souls by fear of force or prison. If I did need money, it wouldn't be dirty money. And your five minutes is up, he said, his tone final. Daniel, desperate to salvage the deal, tried every sales tactic and influence trick he had learned from books and seminars. But it was clear none of it had any effect on Elijah. Elijah fixed Daniel with a stern look. Word of warning. I know people like you. I know what they want. They want power and money off the backs of others. I don't like you. If you send me a letter again, I'll use it in my fire. Do not come back. If I see you on my land, I'll consider you trespassing. And if you do decide to trespass, heed this warning. Do not walk through my woods alone. There are lots of hungry creatures in there, and a weasel like you would be easy pickings. Before Daniel could reply, Elijah turned and disappeared into the trees, vanishing as suddenly as he had appeared. Daniel stood there, momentarily stunned, the echo of Elijah's warning ringing in his ears, the realization that this deal was not going to be as easy as he thought, slowly sank in, leaving a cold feeling in the pit of his stomach. As he turned back to his car, the woods seemed to close in around him whispering secrets of the ancient land he was so eager to claim. Daniel Harrison's return to the Hargrave real estate office was met with an atmosphere starkly different from the one he had left behind. The electric buzz of ambition had been replaced by a tense silence, broken only by the sharp, impatient taps of his boss, Mr. Richard Sterling, on the mahogany desk. Sterling a man whose presence commanded attention was known for his no-nonsense approach and cutthroat attitude. As Daniel entered the office, Sterling's eyes bore into him like steel. Harrison, in here, now, he barked, gesturing to the closed-door meeting room. Inside the room, the air was thick with expectation and impatience. Sterling stood, his hands clasped behind his back, gazing out of the floor-to-ceiling windows at the sprawling city below. Well, he demanded, without turning, his voice laced with barely concealed frustration. Daniel, attempting to maintain his composure, began to explain the situation with Elijah. Sir, the landowner, Elijah, he's not interested in material wealth or... Sterling whirled around, his expression incredulous. Not interested in wealth, Daniel... We are talking about a 1.5 billion pound deal here. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And you're telling me some backwards hermit is holding us up because he doesn't like money? Daniel, feeling the walls closing in, tried to play it smart. Sir, perhaps if we reconsider the approach, maybe a different angle or... But Sterling was having none of it. No, Harrison. I don't want excuses, I want results. That land is crucial for this project. Without it, the deal falls through. 
Do you understand what's at stake here? Not just for the company, but for you. Daniel nodded, a sense of dread settling over him. Sterling leaned in, his gaze sharp and unyielding. This is your moment, Harrison. You close this deal, or you don't bother coming back. If you can't seal this, consider yourself fired. Daniel's heart raced. The threat was clear and unequivocal. He had to find a way to convince Elijah to sell no matter what. The thought of losing this job, especially after the way he had obtained it, was unbearable. Understood, sir. I'll, I'll figure something out. Daniel stammered, his mind racing. Sterling gave him a long, hard look before dismissing him with a wave of his hand. Get out of my sight. And Harrison, don't come back without that land. As Daniel left the office, the weight of Sterling's ultimatum hung heavy on his shoulders. The task ahead seemed impossible, but failure was not an option. He needed to come up with a plan, and fast. The challenge of Elijah and his ancient woodland loomed large in his mind, a puzzle that he had to solve, or his career at Hargrave Real Estate would be over before it truly began. Daniel Harrison's sleek black car stood alone at the edge of Elijah's land, the grandeur of the city a stark contrast to the wild, untamed woods that lay beyond the gate. With a deep breath, he stepped out of the car and began to walk into the heart of the ancient woodland, his polished shoes sinking slightly into the soft earth. As he ventured deeper, the forest seemed to close in around him. Branches snagged at his expensive suit, tear in the fabric, while unseen thorns and brambles scratched and dirted his skin. He pushed forward, convinced that confronting Elijah directly was his only chance to salvage the deal. However, the vastness of the land soon disoriented him. The trees, towering and indistinguishable, seemed to mock his city-bred confidence. Hours passed, and with each step, Daniel became more lost. The light began to fade as evening approached, and the forest transformed into an eerie labyrinth. Swearing under his breath, Daniel's frustration turned to fear when he heard a rustling from the trees. Unnatural noises filled the air. Distant howls, growling, scratching. Panic set in as he heard the heavy breathing of a large animal. His heart pounding, he started to run blindly, not knowing which way was safety. Branches tore at his clothes, mud splashed over him, and his breath came in ragged gasps. After several minutes of frantic running, a small wooden shack with a light burning inside appeared through the trees. Daniel sprinted towards it, desperation giving him speed, and banged on the door with all his might. The door creaked open, revealing Elijah, his expression a mix of amusement and annoyance. Do you not hear that well? I told you not to trespass on my land, he said dryly. Daniel, out of breath and terrified, begged Elijah to let him inside, insisting something was chasing him. Elijah laughed, a deep, rumbling sound that seemed to resonate with the woods themselves. Fine, come in, but let this be a lesson to you, city boy, Elijah said, stepping aside to let Daniel enter the modest interior of the shack. Inside, the shack was warm and surprisingly cosy, a stark contrast to the wild chaos outside. Elijah watched with a smirk as Daniel tried to catch his breath, his expensive suit now torn and covered in mud. <laughs> There's more to this land than you know, Mr. Harrison. Perhaps now you'll think twice before you try to claim it as your own, Elijah said, his voice carrying a hint of warning. Daniel, still shaking from his ordeal, realized just how out of his depth he truly was. The woods, the land, and its enigmatic owner were not forces to be reckoned with lightly. As he stood there, trying to regain his composure, the real estate deal seemed trivial in comparison to the raw, untamed power of the ancient woodland and its guardian. Inside the rustic warmth of Elijah's shack, Daniel, still trembling from his harrowing experience, gathered the remnants 
of his shattered composure. What... what is in those woods? He stammered, his voice barely above a whisper. Elijah's mocking smile widened. Oh, the woods are full of surprises. Things that the city folk like you can't even begin to understand, he replied, his tone laced with amusement. Determined to salvage something from this disastrous encounter, Daniel attempted to steer the conversation back to the land deal. Mr. Elijah, about your land, surely we can negotiate a... Elijah's demeanor abruptly shifted, his eyes flashing dangerously. Negotiate? After you blatantly disregarded my warning and trespassed, I should throw you back out into the dark woods. His voice was a low growl, resonating with a barely contained anger. Daniel recoiled, fear etched on his face. No, please, I beg you don't do that. I... I didn't mean any harm, he whimpered, the memory of the unseen terrors in the woods fresh in his mind. Elijah's expression softened slightly, but his eyes remained hard. Sit down, Mr. Harrison, and listen well. My family has been on this land for generations. This land is ours, bound by a legal clause that's as old as these woods. Under English law, the government can't set foot here unless I invite them, and I have no intention of extending such an invitation. Daniel, still shaken, nodded. Absorbing the words, Elijah continued, his voice now calmer. My family is cursed, afflicted with an illness many years ago. It's a part of who we are, tied to this land. I don't mind the curse. It's kept me away from the greed and pettiness of people. They spend their lives chasing wealth, clawing their way to the top, only to end up the same as everyone else. Worm food. As Elijah spoke, a sense of ancient sorrow seemed to envelop the room. Then a scratching sound at the door, accompanied by heavy breathing and low growling, broke the heavy silence. Daniel's eyes widened in terror, his heart pounding in his chest. Elijah, however, just smiled, almost fondly. Ah, they're restless tonight, he said, his gaze drifting towards the door. Daniel looked from Elijah to the door and back, his panic rising. What is that? Just the creatures of the woods, Elijah said nonchalantly. They won't harm us here. This shack is as much a part of the woods as they are. Daniel couldn't comprehend the calmness in Elijah's voice, the ease with which he accepted the presence of something so terrifyingly unknown. In that moment, Daniel realized how truly alien this world was to him, a world where ancient curses, mysterious creatures, and untamed wilderness were part of the everyday fabric of life. As the scratching continued, Daniel sank into a chair, overwhelmed by the enormity of what he had stumbled into. Elijah's world was one of secrets and ancient bonds, a world far removed from the skyscrapers and contracts of Daniel's life. And in the heart of these woods, Daniel Harrison felt smaller and more insignificant than he ever had before. Elijah, sensing Daniel's escalating fear, chuckled softly. Don't worry, he said, standing up and striding towards the door. He raised his voice, addressing the unseen creatures outside with a commanding tone. Suddenly, the scratching and growling ceased, and an eerie silence enveloped the shack. Daniel exhaled a sigh of relief, his body still trembling. Now about this land, Elijah began, turning back to face him. You see, I've been here for over 300 years. My father, 500 years before me. As he spoke, something extraordinary began to happen. Thick black hair sprouted on his hands and face, his features contorting and reshaping. My curse, you see, is that I'm immortal. So, I really don't need anything you can offer. Elijah continued, his voice deepening and growing more guttural. His eyes changed, taken on a feral glow, while his teeth elongated into sharp fangs. But I will accept one thing, he said, his transformation now nearly complete. Long, sharp claws protruded from his fingers, 
and his entire body was covered in thick, dark fur. Standing fully transformed in the confines of the shack, Elijah towered over Daniel, a true werewolf, his head nearly grazing the ceiling. Daniel, utterly petrified, cowered in the corner, his cries and pleas for mercy filling the small space. But Elijah, now fully embraced by his ancient curse, showed no sign of the man he once was. A blood-curdling scream echoed into the night, swallowed by the dense woods. None but the creatures of the forest heard it, their howls joining in a chorus that seemed both mournful and triumphant. The following day, back at the Hargrave real estate office, Richard Sterling sat at his desk, his expression one of annoyance and resignation. He placed an advertisement for a vacancy, muttering to himself, since Harrison's not back, I guess he failed. The deal for the woodland, now shrouded in an air of mystery and fear, remained untouched. Elijah's land and its ancient secrets would continue to exist untouched by the modern world, a reminder of the primal and untamed forces that lay just beyond the reach of human ambition and greed. And so, the tale of Daniel Harrison and his fateful encounter with the immortal guardian of the woods became yet another whispered legend in the mist-shrouded town, a cautionary tale of the price one pays when blinded by ambition and the dangerous folly of underestimating the ancient powers of the natural world. In the eerie glow of the full moon, a love story with a haunting twist unfolds. Jack, unsuspecting, falls deeply in love with Alara a mysterious woman whose beauty is matched only by her secrecy. As their wedding vows echo through the ancient halls of his family mansion, a chilling truth unravels. Elara belongs to the very gypsy lineage his family condemned generations ago, a lineage cursed with the blood of werewolves. Consumed by a quest for revenge against the suffering inflicted upon her ancestors, Elara unleashes an ancient werewolf curse. Their union, a blend of love and ancient vendetta, now becomes a terrifying struggle for survival as the full moon rises. The quaint town of Silverpine was shrouded in mist as Thomas closed up the library for the evening. The air was cool, carrying the scent of pine and earth after the recent rain. He always loved this time of the day, the quiet moments just after sunset, when the world seemed to hold its breath. As he locked the door, he noticed a figure standing across the street. She was staring at the old silver pine estate that loomed over the town, its turrets silhouetted against the darkening sky. She was striking, with long dark hair that flowed like ink down her back, and her eyes, even from this distance, seemed to glimmer with an otherworldly hue. Curiosity peaked. Thomas approached her. Beautiful, isn't it? He said, gesturing towards the estate. It's been here for centuries, part of the town's history. She turned to him, and her gaze was piercing. Yes, it is beautiful, she replied, her voice melodic, yet tinged with a hint of sadness. I'm Elara, by the way. Thomas, he said, extending his hand. I work at the library. Are you new in town? Yes, Alara smiled, a mysterious allure in her demeanor. Just arrived today. They talked for hours, wandering the cobblestone streets of Silverpine. Alara's knowledge of literature and history fascinated Thomas, and her perspective on life was enchanting. She seemed to understand the very soul of the world, and in turn, she unraveled his own. In the days that followed, their connection deepened. They shared meals, walked through the moonlit woods, and Thomas showed her his favorite books in the library. He was smitten, utterly captivated by this enigmatic woman who had appeared so suddenly in his life. One evening, as they stood 
gazing at the stars from the hills overlooking Silver Pine. Thomas's heart swelled with emotion. Elara, he began, his voice trembling slightly. These past weeks with you have been the happiest of my life. I know this is sudden, but I feel a connection with you that I can't explain. Will you marry me? Elara looked at him, her eyes reflect in the starlight. For a moment, Thomas feared he had been too hasty, but then she smiled, her face softening in the moonlight. Yes, Thomas, she said gently. I will marry you. Joy surged through Thomas as he embraced her, unaware of the secrets she held or the shadow that her acceptance would cast over his life and the town of Silver Pine. Little did he know, his destiny was now irrevocably intertwined with Alara's and the echoes of a long forgotten past were about to resurface. The night was unforgiven, a tempest of snow and wind howling through the Silver Pine estate as if nature itself was enraged. In the heart of the storm, a caravan of gypsies struggled against the blizzard, their faces etched with despair and exhaustion. Among them was a young woman, her eyes a striking contrast against the pallor of the snow, filled with a fierce determination despite the tears that froze on her cheeks. This was Ilara's great-grandmother, Isadora. The gypsies had lived peacefully on the outskirts of Silver Pine for generations, their vibrant culture woven into the tapestry of the town. But that night, they were being driven out, forced off their land by the ancestors of Thomas, the current lords of Silver Pine. Isadora held her young daughter close, whispering promises of safety, even as her heart broke, knowing the truth. The freezing storm was more than just a natural occurrence. It was a weapon, wielded by those who sought their land and feared their differences. The gypsies were blamed for misfortunes and mistrusted for their nomadic lifestyle. That night, the hatred and greed of the Silver Pine ancestors culminated in a merciless decree. Leave or perish. As the caravan trudged through the snow, the brutal cold claimed the weak and the old. Isadora watched in silent horror as her people, her family, succumbed to the storm. With each life lost, a seed of vengeance took root in her heart, a vow to the spirits of her ancestors that their suffering would not be forgotten. Decades passed, and the pain of that night became a whispered legend among the surviving gypsies. But for Alara, it was a legacy, a mission etched into her very being. Back in the present, Elara stood on the balcony of the Silver Pine estate, now her home through her marriage to Thomas. The moon cast a pale light on her face, highlighting the enigmatic smile that curled her lips as she looked out over the land that was once her family's, the memories of her ancestors' suffering fused with her own resolve. Her smile was not one of happiness, but of a plan set into motion, a promise to her forebears that the wrongs against them would be righted. In her heart, the storm of the past raged as fiercely as ever, and she knew the time for retribution was drawing near. Unknown to Thomas, his beloved Elara was not just his wife. She was the bearer of a centuries-old grudge and the heir to a curse that would soon reveal its true nature under the light of the full moon. Thomas and Alara set out early, one crisp morning, the sun casting a golden glow over the fields surrounding Silver Pine. Alara suggested they explore the woodlands at the edge of town, a place Thomas had seldom ventured into. Her enthusiasm was infectious, and he found himself eagerly agreeing. As they walked, the woods seemed to embrace them, the ancient trees whispering secrets of times long past. Alara seemed particularly attuned to the forest, moving with a grace that seemed almost otherworldly. Eventually, they came upon an old burial ground, hidden away and overgrown 
a forgotten chapter in Silver Pine's history. Intrigued, Thomas followed Ilara as she weaved between the weathered headstones, her steps purposeful. Then, hidden beneath a cascade of ivy, they discovered an old crypt, its stone facade worn by the years, but still standing strong. Let's see what's inside, Ilara said, her voice tinged with a curious excitement. The crypt's heavy door creaked ominously as they pushed it open, revealing the dark, musty chamber within. Their footsteps echoed as they explored, the beam of Thomas's flashlight revealing rows of tombs. The air was thick with the scent of wool, earth and age. As they delved deeper, they came across a secluded section of the crypt. Here the tombs or the distinctive markings of a gypsy family. Thomas could see the sorrow in Ilara's eyes as she traced the engravings with her fingers. One tomb, larger and more ornate than the others, was sealed shut, its surface undisturbed for many years. We should open it, Ilara whispered, a strange intensity in her voice. Despite his reservations, Thomas helped her try to move the heavy stone lid but it refused to budge. Frustrated and a little unnerved, they decided to rest outside, beneath the shelter of an old oak. Hours later, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, they returned to the crypt. To their astonishment, the sealed tomb now bore a huge crack down its centre, as if some great force had tried to escape from within. The air around it was colder, charged with a palpable energy. Ilara's eyes shone with a mix of triumph and something deeper, more ancient. She looked at Thomas, a knowing smile playing on her lips. It's a sign, she said softly. The past isn't as buried as we thought. Thomas felt a chill run down his spine, a sense of foreboding he couldn't shake off. The crypt, the cracked tomb, Ilara's enigmatic reaction. It all felt like pieces of a puzzle he was only beginning to understand. As they left the burial ground, the shadows of the crypt seemed to linger, a silent sentinel guarding secrets that were slowly clawing their way to the surface. The night enveloped Silver Pine in a shroud of darkness, the only light coming from the sliver of the crescent moon. Thomas lay awake his mind replaying the day's eerie discoveries. It was then he heard it, a howl, deep and resonant, slicing through the night's stillness. It was unlike any sound he had heard before, filled with a dark, haunting quality that sent shivers down his spine. The following morning, the town of Silverpine awoke to a scene of horror. Livestock were found slaughtered in the fields, their bodies mangled in a grotesque display. The townspeople murmured in fears and confusion, but the worst was yet to come. On the outskirts of town, near the edge of the woods, they found a man torn to shreds as if mauled by a wild beast. The brutality of the attack was chilling, leaving the villagers in a state of shock and fear. Amidst this chaos, Thomas realized Alara was missing Panic gripped him as he searched their home, calling her name, but there was no sign of her. Driven by a growing sense of dread, he made his way to the old burial ground, the memory of the previous day gnawing at him. The burial ground was eerily silent as he entered. Then he heard it, a soft chanting, a voice he knew all too well. Following the sound, he found Ilara kneeling before the broken tomb. Her eyes closed, murmuring in an ancient gypsy language. Elara, Thomas exclaimed, a mix of relief and confusion in his voice. What are you doing here? Elara looked up, her expression one of solemnity. I thought perhaps what happened last night was a consequence of us disturbing this place, she said softly. I came here to apologize to the spirits, to seek their forgiveness. Thomas's fear subsided, replaced by a bemused affection for her beliefs. He laughed gently, reaching out to comfort her. It's okay, Alara. 
I don't think the spirits are responsible for what happened. Let's go home. As they walked away from the burial ground, Thomas glanced back at the crypt, its secret seemingly at rest once more. But Elara cast a lingering look over her shoulder, a subtle, knowing smile gracing her lips. In her eyes, there was a glint of satisfaction, a hint of a plan unfolding just as she had envisioned. Unseen to Thomas, the lines of past and present were blurring, and Alara was at the heart of it, a bridge between the vengeful spirits of her ancestors and the unsuspecting town of Silver Pine. The night's horrors were just the beginning, and Alara was the key to a mystery that was slowly unravelling under the watchful gaze of the moon. The atmosphere in Silver Pine was tense, a palpable fear hanging in the air as the townsfolk prepared for another night of uncertainty. Street patrols were organised and guards stood vigilant at the farms. The town was a fortress, braced for the return of the mysterious beast. Inside their home, Thomas and Elara sat in silence, the gravity of the situation weighing heavily on them. However, Elara's demeanour was unusually stern and direct, a stark contrast to her usual gentle nature. Thomas couldn't help but feel unsettled by this change. As the night deepened, a distant howl pierced the quiet, a sound that seemed to resonate with the very soul of Silverpine. Elara stood up abruptly, a smile curving her lips. The smile sent a shiver of terror down Thomas's spine. We'd best be careful, Elara, he said, his voice tinged with apprehension. We? She replied, her tone enigmatic. Thomas clutched his shotgun, loaded and ready, a sense of foreboding enveloping him. Suddenly, a loud crash echoed from the back of the house. Something had smashed through the window. With the town's focus elsewhere, Thomas realised they were isolated, vulnerable. A gust of wind howled through the broken window, sending lamps crashing to the floor and chairs toppling over. Then, amidst the chaos, Thomas saw it, a creature of nightmares. Half man, half beast, lurking in the shadows, its eyes burning with pure hatred. Without hesitation, Thomas aimed his shotgun at the beast and fired. The creature let out a horrendous howl, a sound that seemed to shake the very foundations of the house before it fled into the night. Elara stood motionless, watching the beast disappear. Her expression was unreadable, a mask that concealed her true emotions. Thomas, still gripping his shotgun, turned to her, searching for some explanation in her eyes, but Elara remained silent, her gaze fixed on the darkness outside, where the beast had vanished. The night was far from over, and the true nature of the terror that haunted Silverpine was yet to be revealed. As the wind continued to howl through the broken window, Thomas felt a growing sense of dread. The beast was out there, and it was clear that this nightmare was only just beginning. Silverpine had settled into an uneasy quiet in the days following the night of terror. The townsfolk, still on edge, clung to Thomas's assurance that he had slain the beast with his shotgun. They wanted to believe the nightmare was over, that their town was safe once more. Thomas busied himself with repairs around the house, replacing the shattered windows and fixing the damage wrought by the creature's invasion. He tried to shake off the lingering unease, convincing himself that the threat was gone. Meanwhile, Alara's actions were shrouded in secrecy. Unbeknownst to Thomas, or anyone else in the town, she spent her days at the tomb, immersed in ancient rituals. The crypt, with its cracked tomb and whispered secrets, had become her sanctuary, a place where she could connect with the spirits of her ancestors. Her chants, in the old gypsy language, echoed off the stone walls, a haunting melody that seemed to resonate with the very air around her. With each word, each intonation, she felt the power of her lineage flow through her, 
strengthening her resolve for what was to come. On this particular day, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows over the burial ground, Ilara stood up. Her eyes, alight with a fierce determination, gazed at the cracked tomb. The air around her seemed to pulse with energy, as if responding to her presence. It is time, she said to herself, her voice a mere whisper, but laden with purpose. Without another glance at the tomb, Alara turned and made her way back home. Her steps were confident, each one bringing her closer to the culmination of a plan centuries in the making. As she walked, the town of Silverpine lay ahead, unsuspecting and peaceful in the twilight. But beneath the calm, a storm was brewing, a reckoning that would soon shake the very foundations of the town and reveal the true nature of the nightmare that had descended upon them. Elara, the link between past and present, between the spirits of her ancestors and the unsuspecting townsfolk, was ready to set the final act into motion. The sun had set on Silverpine, casting long shadows across the town as Thomas and Elara sat in their home. Thomas had taken every precaution, building a fortified safe room within the house. Its massive bolted door was designed to withstand any force a sanctuary against the horrors that lurked outside. As they sat together, the eerie calm was shattered by a familiar and chilling howl. Thomas's heart sank. It's back, he said, a tremor in his voice. He urged Delara towards the safe room. Quickly, go inside. I'll handle this. With Delara safely inside, Thomas loaded his shotgun, his hands shaking slightly. He waited his breath shallow as the tension in the air grew thicker. With a terrifying crash, the beast burst through the window. Its monstrous form, half man, half beast, eyes burning with a feral hatred. Thomas fired, but the creature seemed unfazed, continuing its relentless advance. Realizing the futility of his efforts, Thomas retreated to the safe room. He bolted the door behind him, his heart pounding. There's no way it'll get through there, he assured himself. But then, a low growling filled the room. Thomas spun around, his blood turning to ice as he witnessed Alara beginning to transform, her body contorted, her features morphing into a grotesque fusion of woman and beast. There's also no escape, she snarled, her voice a guttural echo of her human self. My great-grandfather waits outside, while I'm here with you. Thomas recoiled in horror as the truth dawned on him. Elara, the woman he loved, was part of the nightmare. Why? He gasped, barely able to comprehend the unfolding scene. Elara's eyes, now a glowing amber, bore into him. Vengeance, she growled. Your ancestors destroyed my family, left us to die in the cold. Now their bloodline ends with you. Thomas's pleas were drowned out by her growling. The room was filled with a palpable sense of dread, the walls seeming to close in on him. There was no escape, no way out of the fate that awaited him. As Ilara advanced, her form now fully that of a werewolf, Thomas's screams echoed through the safe room. The sound of his terror was the last thing heard before a haunting silence fell over the house. Outside, the beast that was once Ilara's great-grandfather howled a mournful sound that carried through the night. In the town of Silverpine, under the watchful gaze of the moon, a tragic tale of revenge reached its bloody conclusion, a cycle of hatred and retribution come in full circle. The screams faded, and the night reclaimed its silence. The shadows of the past forever etched into the legacy of Silver Pine. Three friends venture deep into the woods, drawn by tales of a sinister tree harboring an ancient evil. Little do they know, this monstrous entity hungers for revenge, and it's ready to help them settle old scores with those who've wronged them, at a terrifying cost. 
in the small, sleepy town of Elmswood, nestled at the edge of a dense and sprawling forest, three friends gathered at their favourite spot, a cosy corner in the town's oldest cafe, the Rusty Kettle. It was a rainy afternoon, the kind that made the town feel even more isolated from the rest of the world. Have you guys heard about the Whispering Woods legend? Asked Emma, her eyes sparkling with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. She was the adventurous one in the group, always keen on exploring the unknown. Her friends, Luke and Hannah, exchanged a glance. Luke, a tall, athletic guy with a sceptical mind, shrugged. You mean that old story about the creature in the woods? That's just a tale to scare kids, Em. Hannah, a quiet, thoughtful girl with a love for local history, chimed in. It's more than just a story. My grandma used to tell me about it. She said there's something ancient and unnatural living in those woods, under an old tree. The cafe was filled with the sound of rain tapping against the windows and the low hum of other customers chatting. Emma leaned in closer, lowering her voice. They say it's been trapped for centuries. A creature with massive teeth and thick fur. But the creepiest part is that it can mimic human voices, luring people into the woods by imitating their loved ones. Luke rolled his eyes, but was visibly intrigued. And you believe that? Why don't we find out? Emma proposed, her eyes gleaming with excitement. Let's go to the Whispering Woods this evening. If there's any truth to the legend, tonight's the perfect night to discover it. Hannah hesitated, fidgeting with her coffee cup. I don't know, Emma. It sounds dangerous. Come on, Han. It'll be an adventure. We'll stick together. And Luke, or oh, you don't believe in the legend anyway, right? What harm could it do to check it out? After a moment of silence, Luke sighed. A grin spreading across his face. All right, we'll do it. But if we find nothing but trees and squirrels, I'm going to remind you of this every time you bring up another legend. Emma clapped her hands in excitement. It's settled then. We'll meet here at dusk and head into the Whispering Woods. Who knows what we'll find? As the afternoon waned, the friends finished their coffees and parted ways each lost in their thoughts about the impending adventure. The rain continued to fall, casting a gloomy shadow over Elmswood, as if nature itself was aware of the eerie journey the friends were about to embark on. The legend of the Whispering Woods, a tale woven into the fabric of the town for generations, was about to be explored, and none of them could foresee the chain of horrifying events they were about to unleash dense forest of the Whispering Woods loomed before Emma, Luke and Hannah as they stood at its threshold, the dying light of the day casting long shadows between the trees. The air was thick with the earthy scent of damp soil and the faint, unsettling rustle of leaves in the gentle breeze. The friends, armed with flashlights and an unspoken bond of curiosity, ventured into the woods their footsteps muffled by the mossy ground. As they delved deeper, the forest seemed to close in around them, the trees older and more gnarled, as if they were entering a different world, a forgotten part of time. It wasn't long before they stumbled upon an ancient tree, towering and twisted, its bark etched with carvings and symbols that seemed to dance eerily in the flashlight beams. The ground around the tree was a macabre scene. Bones and remnants of fresh kills lay scattered, a chilling testament to the legend they had only whispered about in the safety of the cafe. At the base of the tree, there was a small opening, just large enough for a hand to fit through or for a small animal to enter. A sudden, low growling emanated from the hole, a sound so primal and unnerving it sent shivers down their spines. Without a word, they turned and fled, the underbrush scratching at their clothes as they ran. Once they were a safe distance away, hidden by a thicket, Luke, panting heavily, said, 
Let's watch for a while, see if anything happens. They huddled together, their initial giggles and jokes soon fading into an anxious silence as they focused on the ominous tree. As the sky darkened, a small rabbit, unaware of the danger, hopped towards the tree, sniffing curiously around it. Without warning, a hand, or what resembled a hand, emerged from the hole. It was covered in fur, with long, grotesque claws. In a swift, almost unnatural movement, it grabbed the rabbit. A muffled noise followed, and then an unsettling quiet. The friends exchanged looks of shock and disbelief. The legend was no longer just a story. It was real, and it was more horrifying than they could have imagined. As darkness enveloped the forest, they agreed to return home and come back the next day, armed with better cameras and equipment. They needed proof. They needed to understand what lurked within the whispering woods. But as they made their way back through the shadowy forest, each of them couldn't shake off the feeling that they had just awakened something ancient and malevolent. Luke stepped out of his house, the morning sun barely cresting the horizon. In his hand, he clutched a camera, his mind set on capturing whatever truth lay hidden within the whispering woods. As he made his way to his car, a familiar and unwelcome voice called out to him. Where are you going, pretty boy? Ben sneered, flanked by two of his usual cronies. Ben had been the bane of Luke's school days, a relentless bully who seemed to take pleasure in tormenting others. Luke's grip tightened on the camera. Just out for some photography, he replied, trying to keep his voice steady. Ben scoffed, stepping closer. And where are those two girls you're always hanging around with? We're in the mood for partying. His friends laughed, a harsh sound that grated on Luke's nerves. Before Luke could react, Ben shoved him hard. Make sure you be sharing now, he taunted. Those girls look sweet. His friends echoed his laughter, pushing Luke again. Frustration boiling within him, Luke quickly got into his car and drove away, leaving Ben and his cronies behind. He met up with Emma and Hannah a few minutes later, his mood visibly dampened by the encounter. Everything okay, Luke? Hannah asked, noticing his troubled expression. Yeah, just Ben and his goons. Luke replied, forcing a smile. As they drove towards the whispering woods, Luke's thoughts were a mix of anger and apprehension. One day, those bullies will get their lot, he muttered, more to himself than to his friends. Emma, who had been listening quietly, suddenly chimed in with a mischievous glint in her eye. Stick them in the hole for the creature, she suggested, half jokingly. <laughs> Luke couldn't help but smile at the thought, a brief respite from his frustration. The idea of Ben facing off against the mysterious creature of the woods was oddly satisfying. But as they parked near the forest's edge, the reality of their mission set in. They were about to delve into the unknown to uncover the truth behind a legend that had already shown its terrifying face. With cameras in hand and a mix of fear and determination in their hearts, they stepped into the whispering woods, unaware of the horrors that awaited them. The morning sun filtered through the dense canopy of the whispering woods as Emma, Luke and Hannah set up a makeshift campsite. They chose a spot just far enough from the ancient tree to remain unseen, but close enough to keep a watchful eye on the mysterious den at its base. They positioned their cameras with zoom lenses aimed directly at the small, ominous opening in the tree. Hours passed in tense anticipation. The forest was alive with the sounds of nature, but the area around the ancient tree seemed unnaturally still, as if the creatures of the woods knew to steer clear of it. Then a deer, oblivious to the danger, meandered close to the tree. It was much too large to fit into the hole, but that didn't matter. In a blur of movement, the clawed hand shot out from the opening, grasping the deer with terrifying strength. Within seconds, 
The deer was pulled into the hole, devoured whole by whatever lurked within. Did you get that? Emma whispered, her eyes wide with shock. Luke fumbled with his camera, a mix of frustration and disbelief on his face. No, I didn't hit record, he admitted, regret lace in his voice. A deep, resonating growl then emanated from the tree, sending a chill down their spines. Luke, driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, suggested, Let's shine a light in the hole, see what's in there. Are you crazy? Hannah responded, her voice laced with worry. I'll stay far enough back so I'm out of reach. Luke assured her, though his own heart raced with apprehension. He cautiously approached the hole and attempted to shine his flashlight into it. Strangely, the beam of light seemed to be swallowed by the darkness, unable to penetrate the inky blackness of the den. As he peered into the abyss, Luke could have sworn he saw two glowing red eyes watching him, sending a wave of primal fear through his body. Luke, I've got to get back. I have class at two. Emma called out, startling him and breaking the tense moment. They quickly packed up their equipment, each of them silent, lost in their thoughts about the day's chilling discoveries. As they made their way out of the whispering woods, the sense of being watched lingered with them, a haunting reminder of the creature that now knew they had trespassed into its domain. The drive back to town was quiet, each of them processing the terrifying reality that the legend of the Whispering Woods was no mere story, but a living nightmare. Luke's mind was a whirlwind of thoughts as he drove back to his small apartment, the events at the Whispering Woods replaying over and over. The girls had gone off to their classes, leaving him alone with his turbulent thoughts. As he unlocked the door to his apartment, he was completely unprepared for what awaited him. Before he could react, Luke was blindsided. Ben and his cronies had broken into his apartment, lying in wait. So, where's those girls? We don't like people who don't share, Lukey boy. Ben sneered, his face twisted into a malicious grin. Without warning, Ben's fist connected with Luke's face, sending him sprawling to the floor. The other two goons joined in, kicking him mercilessly as he lay on the ground. Through the haze of pain, Luke saw Ben rummaging through his belonging, taking anything of value. Gritting his teeth, Luke came up with a desperate plan. All right, he gasped, trying to sound convincing. I just came back to get some condoms. They're waiting for me in the woods. We were going to have a party, but I guess you guys can join. Ben's eyes lit up with a vile excitement. All right, that's what I'm talking about, Lukey boy. With a pounding heart, Luke led the three bullies to his car and drove towards the woods, his mind racing. As they approached the ancient tree, Luke's anxiety peaked. They should be waiting at the tree. They said they'll be naked and hiding. He lied. The three bullies rushed towards the tree, shouting out for the girls. Where are you at, girls? Ben called out. Then one of the goons noticed the hole at the base of the tree. Hey, there's a hole here. In a split second, a furry arm shot out from the darkness, grabbing the goon. His screams pierced the air as his friends rushed to his aid, only to be ensnared by another grotesque hand that emerged from the hole. In moments, all three were pulled into the hole, disappearing into the darkness. Luke stood frozen, shock and disbelief coursing through him. Slowly he approached the tree, peering into the abyss. The two glowing red eyes were there, watching him, and in the eerie silence of the woods, Luke was certain he heard a voice, a whisper that seemed to come from the depths of the hole. Thank you, Luke. As he stumbled back from the tree, Luke's mind was a whirlwind of emotions, fear, relief, guilt, and a strange sense of justice mixed within him. The bullies had met a fate beyond comprehension, pulled into a nightmare that was all too real. As he left the whispering woods, the weight of what had happened settled heavily upon him. The creature in the woods was no longer just a legend, 
It was a living entity that had shown gratitude in its own horrifying way. Luke lay sprawled on his couch, nursing his bruises, when a knock at the door startled him. He cautiously opened it to find Hannah and Emma standing there, concern etched on their faces. My God, Luke. Your face. What's happened? Hannah exclaimed, her eyes widening at the sight of his injuries. Ben and his goons, Luke replied, his voice tinged with a mix of anger and exhaustion. That's it. I'm calling the police. Emma said firmly, reaching for her phone. No, I've taken care of them. Luke interrupted, his voice low. I led them to the hole. And that thing, it ate them. Emma and Hannah exchanged a glance, then burst into laughter, thinking it was a joke. But Luke's serious expression quickly wiped the smiles off their faces. No, really, Luke insisted. It ate them as if they were nothing, and it thanked me. The laughter died as the gravity of Luke's words sank in. A heavy silence fell over the room, broken only by Hannah's soft sobs. She finally spoke, her voice trembling. Billy Lothan, she said, tears streaming down her cheeks. He... he forced me, you know. I screamed and tried to fight him, but... She couldn't finish her sentence, overcome with emotion. Luke and Emma exchanged shocked glances. Emma, her face pale, turned to Luke. What about you, Emma? Luke asked gently. What? No, I can't. I'm good. Emma protested, but her voice lacked conviction. Well, let's do it, Luke said decisively, a dark resolve in his eyes. As they hatched a plan to lure Billy Lothan to the hole, Hannah wiped her tears and sent him a text, telling him she wanted to see him again and would be waiting at the tree. The message sent. The three friends sat in silence, each grappling with the moral implications of what they were about to do. But the pain and injustice they had endured seemed to overpower any doubts. They were set on a path of vengeance, one that would lead them back to the sinister depths of the Whispering Woods. Under the cover of dense foliage near the ancient tree, Luke, Emma and Hannah lay in wait. The air was thick with tension and unspoken apprehension as they watched for Billy Lothan's arrival. As predicted, he swaggered into view, his voice carrying arrogantly through the woods. Where you at, Hannah? So good you want some more, huh? He approached the tree, his eyes scanning the surroundings. Spotting the hole, he bent down to peer inside, but nothing stirred in the darkness. Seemingly disappointed, Billy straightened up and began to walk away. No, you have to pay. Hannah whispered fiercely to herself. She couldn't let him just walk away, not after what he'd done. With a burst of courage, she stood up and ran towards the tree. I'm here, she called out, her voice laced with a mixture of fear and determination. Billy turned, a smug grin spreading across his face as he saw Hannah. He wrapped his arms around her. Ready for round two, baby. He leered. Standing at the edge of the hole, Hannah's face was a mask of resolve. She began to kick at the edge of the hole, screaming, Here, take him, take him. Billy shoved her away, his expression turning from lust to confusion and anger. You crazy, he spat out. Oh, well, let's do something about that. But at that very moment, a grotesque, clawed hand shot out from the hole. With a strength and speed that defied nature, it grabbed Billy and dragged him screaming into the darkness. Ah! Anna stood there, a mix of horror and satisfaction on her face. As she peered into the hole, the words, Thank you, Anna, seemed to whisper from the depths, sending a shiver down her spine. She knew it was the creature, acknowledging her in its own terrifying way. Luke and Emma, who had watched in stunned silence, rushed to Hannah's side. They stood together, looking at the hole, a sense of eerie closure washing over them. The monster in the whispering woods 
had become their unwitting avenger, a dark guardian that exacted the justice they felt the world had denied them. As the trio prepared to leave the Whispering Woods, a sudden change overcame Emma. She turned towards the ancient tree with a look of determination and fear mixed in her eyes. I'm not having this. We can't do this anymore. She declared resolutely. Before Luke or Hannah could react, Emma sprinted back to the car, grabbed a spade, and began to furiously dig around the edges of the hole. Luke rushed after her, grabbing her arm in an attempt to stop her. Stop, Emma. What if it gets out? But Emma was beyond reasoning. She swung the spade with a frantic energy, the hole growing larger and more unstable with each strike. Hannah joined Luke, trying to pull Emma away. Think, Em. What if it gets out and goes into town? It's just eaten a deer and four people. How much could it eat? The whole town? Her words finally penetrated Emma's frenzied state, and she halted, the reality of the situation crashing down on her. Tears streamed down her face as the gravity of what they had unleashed hit her. Luke and Hannah embraced her, offering silent support. The three friends slowly walked back to the car, each lost in their own thoughts, the weight of their actions heavy on their hearts. They swore to each other to never return to this accursed place, to try and forget the horrors they had witnessed and been a part of. As they drove away, the creature in the whispering woods made its move. With the last pieces of dirt removed by Emma's desperate digging, it pushed itself out of its ancient prison. Freed from the sacred earth that had bound it for centuries, it emerged into the woods, a dark silhouette against the fading light. It looked up to the sky and let out an eerie, triumphant howl. In the car, a chill ran down Emma's spine as she heard a voice in her head, clear and haunting. And thank you most of all, Emma. The words echoed in her mind, a chilling reminder of the dark pact they had unwittingly made with the creature of the woods. As they left the whispering woods behind, the friends knew their lives would never be the same. They had faced their demons, but in doing so, they had unleashed something far more terrifying into the world. The end of their ordeal marked the beginning of a new, darker chapter for the town of Elmswood. And if you're still looking to fulfill your thirst for more horror, don't forget to check out this next video. Unless, of course, you're frozen with fear already.